Section 7 of England Since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 4 The Last Years of Tory Rule, 1822 to 1830, Social and Fiscal Reforms, Catholic Emancipation, Part 1. An attempt was made in the last chapter to explain the part played by England in European politics during the years which followed the Napoleonic Wars. A secondary purpose was to expose the fallacy which associates the substitution of Canning for Castlereagh with a new era in English foreign policy. Despite their contrasted temperaments, the two statesmen pursued a common end but if canning did not introduce a new system into diplomacy he did enforce together with his colleagues peel huskisson and robinson a new spirit in domestic legislation the various manifestations of that new spirit it is the purpose of the following pages to disclose it is usual to date the era of reform from the accession of the whig party to power in eighteen thirty then, as often, it happened that a powerful stimulus was given to legislation by the electoral success of a party long excluded from office. But the causes of reform and reaction go far deeper than mere party oscillations and cannot be satisfactorily explained by party triumphs. In this case, the period of stagnation closed not in 1830, but in 1822. The era of reform was coincident, not with the formation of Lord Grey's administration, but with the reconstruction of that of Lord Liverpool. The change of ministerial personnel in 1822 and 1823 was, as we have seen, comprehensive and significant. Canning, it will be remembered, succeeded Londonderry, not only at the Foreign Office, but in the leadership of the House of Commons. Peel, with a reputation immensely enhanced by his skilful conduct of currency reforms, replaced Lord Sidmouth, Addington, at the Home Office. The support of the Grenville Whigs was conciliated by the appointment of C. W. Wynne as President of the Board of Control, and the hopes of the Catholics were naturally raised by Lord Wellesley's acceptance of the Lord Lieutenancy of Ireland, and still more by Plunkett's appointment as Attorney General. Even more clearly indicative of impending change of policy were the appointments to the Exchequer and the Board of Trade. Van Sittert, most incompetent of financiers, was raised to the peerage as Lord Bexley and receded into the Chancellorship of the Duchy of Lancaster. F. J. Robinson, replaced him at the Exchequer, and was in turn succeeded at the Board of Trade by William Huskisson. Exceptionally strong in general administrative ability, few cabinets since the inception of parliamentary government have contained three more prominent financiers than Peel, Huskisson, and Robinson, while Canning himself, as his speeches and essays abundantly prove, had a firm grip upon economic principles. The influence of these men is clearly discernible in the legislation promoted by the reconstructed ministry. Quite apart, however, from changes in ministerial personnel, reforms of a drastic nature could not have been much longer delayed. During the last thirty years, scarcely a single remedial measure had been placed upon the statute book. For this legislative stagnation, no one in England was to blame. Twenty-five years had been more than fully occupied by the struggle against revolutionary and Napoleonic France. Pitt, an ardent administrative reformer, had wisely, though reluctantly, put aside a congenial task for something even more immediately important. It is unwise, as Wyndham said, to repair one's house in the hurricane season. So Pitt felt, 
and his reforming work upon which he had made an excellent beginning during his first nine years of office was postponed to a more convenient season upon twenty-five years of war there had supervened five years of economic distress and social agitation the hurricane was still blowing though from a different quarter once more reform was postponed but since eighteen twenty there had been a marked improvement in the situation the worst of the commercial and financial crisis was obviously over trade revived social order was restored and men's minds turned hopefully toward the prospect of legislative amelioration several questions of first-rate importance insistently demanded a solution the parliamentary successes of lord john russell eighteen twenty to eighteen twenty one reinforced by the yorkshire petition of eighteen twenty three proved that the question of electoral reform could not be much longer postponed the inclusion of canning and plunkett in the ministry compelled lord liverpool to continue to treat catholic emancipation as an open question the inclusion of huskisson was a pledge of fiscal reform mackintosh was exposing the ghastly barbarities of the criminal code wilberforce and foxel buxton those of slavery in the world of industry the combination laws pressed with peculiar severity upon wage earners and some readjustment of the relations between capital and labor were imperatively required the first question with which the new ministers elected to deal was the scandalous condition of the criminal law peel's tenure of the home office was memorable for its amendment derided by disraeli as a burglar of other men's ideas peel certainly possessed in exceptional measure the faculty of bringing to legislative fruition the seeds sown by others in the reform of the criminal law romilly planted mackintosh watered peel reaped the legislative harvest the conditions of things before wise men began their crusade was nothing short of appalling for no fewer than two hundred offences the death penalty could still be legally inflicted procedure was antiquated and defective the innocent were sometimes convicted the guilty constantly escaped the severity of the law of course defeated its own object it blunted the moral conscience of the nation it obliterated the distinction between offences trivial and grave it encouraged serious and persistent crime it failed to deter the casual offender criminal procedure was reduced to a farce juries naturally refused to convict for petty offences when conviction might cost the offender his life poachers and shoplifters were sentenced to death by the score but rarely suffered the death penalty of six hundred and fifty-five persons indicted for shoplifting between eighteen o five and eighteen o seven one hundred and thirteen were sentenced to death but not in one case was the penalty enforced on the other hand between eighteen eleven and eighteen eighteen over one hundred persons went to the gallows for the crime of forgery but even before the efforts of the legislative reformers humane practice had outrun barbarous precept during the last three-quarters of a century only twenty-five crimes out of a possible two hundred had actually evoked the extreme penalty but it was high time that the law should be brought into accord with practice as a result of many years labor romilly carried two trifling amendments and on his death in eighteen eighteen sir james mackintosh kept the question well to the fore in eighteen twenty two the house of commons pledged itself at an early period of the next session to take into its serious consideration the means of increasing the efficiency of the criminal code by abating its rigour this pledge was handsomely redeemed by peel 
during his first tenure of the home office from eighteen twenty two to eighteen twenty seven no less than two hundred and seventy eight acts were repealed and such of their provisions as were still valuable were reenacted in eight new statutes one hundred felonies were by a stroke of the pen removed from the category of capital offences and before he finally left the home office in eighteen thirty he had the satisfaction of knowing that the death penalty could no longer be pronounced much less enforced except upon offenders convicted of serious crime this was peel's most substantial achievement as home secretary but it was not the only one he abolished benefit of clergy and criminal offences he removed various scandals and anomalies in the marriage laws he improved the condition of the jails he reformed criminal procedure he consolidated and amended no less than sixty-six acts relating to the constitution and functions of juries and finally he associated both his names imperishably with the establishment of a new police force in the metropolis eighteen twenty nine it will not be forgotten that during his second tenure of the home office from eighteen twenty eight to eighteen thirty peel was also leader of the house of commons and in that capacity was responsible for the catholic emancipation act but apart from that his legislative record is sufficiently remarkable peel's industry and enthusiasm were contagious while he was busy at the home office robinson and huskisson steadily backed in the house by canning were effecting changes of the first magnitude in the commercial system of the country robinson best known by the sobriquet of prosperity was a sound economist and a capable administrator his colleague deserves to rank among the greatest financiers this country has produced born in seventeen seventy william huskisson was returned to the house of commons in seventeen ninety six and served his apprenticeship at the treasury under pitt on the latter's death he attached himself to canning with whom he resigned in eighteen o nine restored to office as minister of woods and forests in eighteen fourteen he quickly established his reputation as one of the first financial authorities in the house his pamphlets and speeches gave him an incontestable claim to a place on the bullion committee of eighteen nineteen and also upon the committee which was appointed in eighteen twenty one to consider the question of agricultural distress on the reconstruction of the ministry he might naturally have aspired as liverpool frankly explained to the king to the highest financial post but canning induced him to accept the combined offices of treasurer of the navy and president of the board of trade with the promise speedily fulfilled of admission to the cabinet his influence upon his colleagues and particularly upon robinson was soon apparent order and simplicity were introduced into the national accounts the sinking fund dear to the heart of van Sittert, was shorn of its objectionable features and only the realized surplus was applied to it a large amount of taxation was remitted the expenses of revenue collection were sensibly reduced the national debt was diminished at the rate of some six millions a year and finally advantage was taken of the improved credit of the country to effect a conversion of the four per cent annuities for these excellent results the credit belongs primarily to robinson but even more important were the commercial and fiscal reforms initiated by huskisson himself for the most adroit financier can effect little when the creation of national wealth is retarded by a vicious commercial system to remove burdensome restrictions upon trade to stimulate production to encourage exchange to develop by every means in his power the economic resources of the country these were the objects which huskisson set himself to achieve the navigation or trade laws still lay at the roots of the old commercial system though large inroads had already been made upon their integrity passed in sixteen fifty one 
1660 and 1672, they continued for nearly 200 years to form the foundation of British commercial policy. Stripped of technical details, these acts provided that no merchandise should be imported into England, Ireland, or any British plantation from Asia, Africa, or America in any but English-built and English-owned ships navigated by an English commander and manned by a crew of which at least three-fourths were Englishmen. From European countries, goods might be imported in English ships thus defined or under discriminating duties in ships belonging to the country in which the goods were produced. Aimed primarily at the mercantile supremacy of the Dutch, it cannot be denied that these acts attained their object and contributed largely to the commercial and naval ascendancy of Great Britain. They won, moreover, unstinted praise from Adam Smith, who was magnanimous enough to prefer political to commercial considerations. On Ireland, no doubt, the trade laws pressed hardly until the Union, but to the plantations they were not in earlier years at least a disadvantage. Every effort, it is true, was made to secure for the mother country the primary advantages of colonial trade. But it is not clear that the colonies suffered by the process. This much, at any rate, may be said in defense of the system assailed by Huskisson. It was avowedly inspired by consideration of power, not by consideration of plenty. It regarded security rather than wealth. It preferred defense to opulence. It was in harmony with the prevailing ideas, economic and political, and it secured its end. Under it, England and her dependencies increased mightily in power and did not apparently lack plenty. Moreover, as time went on and occasion demanded, much of its apparent harshness towards the colonists was mitigated in practice by a prudent carelessness on the part of authority. To this slackness, George Grenville was the disastrous exception. His conscientious discharge of duty lost us our first colonial empire. The successful revolt of the thirteen colonies dealt a mortal blow at the old system. Excluded from its benefits and exposed to its disadvantages, the Americans retaliated in kind. Retaliation led to negotiations, and by the Treaty of 1814, the ships of the two countries were placed reciprocally upon the same footing in the ports of England and the United States, and all discriminating duties chargeable upon the goods which they conveyed were mutually repealed. But apart from our own colonies, the face of America was changing rapidly. Brazil became independent of Portugal, and the Spanish colonies were throwing off the feeble but galling yoke of the mother country. In a great speech delivered on March 31, 1825, Huskisson agreed that these changes placed our own colonies at a relative commercial disadvantage and that the old commercial system must be abandoned if the political connection was to be maintained. By legislation passed in 1822, a large but in their view insufficient measure of freedom had been granted to the colonies. The Reciprocity Act of 1825 extended the same principle to foreign countries. Power was given to the King in Council to conclude reciprocity treaties and to discriminate still further against countries which declined them. Under this Act, treaties were concluded with all the important countries of the world, including our old rival the Netherlands. But though largely deprived of their sting, the Navigation Act still remained upon the statute book, and by an act of 1845 were actually consolidated and reenacted. But it was an expiring policy. Against the prevailing spirit of laissez-faire, such restrictions could not even theoretically stand, and in 1849 they were entirely swept away. Thus was the policy of Huskisson 
carried to its logical conclusion that an immense impulse was thereby given to the overseas trade of great britain is undeniable but it remains an open question whether in the process provisions still of some value to national security were not unnecessarily sacrificed but the relaxation of the navigation laws was only a part of the general commercial policy of huskisson a whole-hearted theoretical free trader he was convinced that national prosperity would be most effectually promoted by an unrestrained competition not only between the capital and the industry of different classes in the same country but also by extending that competition as much as possible to all other countries but he proceeded cautiously duties not exceeding thirty per cent were substituted in some cases for absolute prohibition in others for exorbitant but ineffective duties thus foreign manufactured silk and foreign gloves articles hitherto prohibited but to be bought in every shop were admitted at a duty of thirty per cent on cotton goods a uniform duty of ten per cent was substituted for duties varying from fifty per cent to seventy five per cent on linens a fixed duty of twenty five per cent for duties varying from forty per cent to one hundred and eighty per cent on woollens fifteen per cent for fifty per cent to sixty seven and a half per cent and so on iron copper zinc tin lead earthenware glass paper bottles printed books and many other articles were brought into huskisson's comprehensive schedule but imports were by no means to be free huskisson was a tariff reformer not a tariff abolitionist a tariff was devised primarily with a view to revenue incidentally to afford some measure of protection to the home producer and some preference to the colonies and not least to kill the smuggling trade let the state said huskisson have the tax which is now the reward of the smuggler and let the consumer have the better and cheaper article without the painful consciousness that he is consulting his own convenience at the expense of daily violating the laws of his country but while the state and the consumer were his first consideration the interests of the manufacturer were not forgotten if under the new tariff he had to face foreign competition the simultaneous reduction of duties on raw materials gave him a better chance of facing it successfully other changes were about the same time effected bounties on exports were gradually abolished laws forbidding the emigration of artisans and providing for the regulation of wages in the spitalfield silk industry were repealed and most important of all a serious effort was made to relieve the increasing tension between labor and capital by the repeal of the combination laws the english law had always regarded trade combinations of all kinds with extreme disfavor as conspiracies in restraint of trade from the time of edward i to that of george the fourth legislation directed against such associations had been practically continuous and conspicuously inoperative in eighteen twenty three the statute book contained from thirty to forty enactments designed to prevent associations either of employers or employed it was not however until the last years of the eighteenth century when the economic results of the industrial revolution began to be felt that trade unions as now understood became obtrusive in eighteen hundred a strenuous attempt was made by the legislature to crush them once for all under the act of that year any artisan who combined with others to advance his wages to decrease the quantity of his output or to interfere with the management of the business rendered himself liable to imprisonment in a word the strike was a crime the trade union was an unlawful association 
during the next twenty years more particularly during the period of trade depression after eighteen fifteen the relations of labour and capital became steadily worse the repeal of the spitalfields act and of the act prohibiting emigration brought the whole question to the notice of parliament and a select committee appointed in eighteen twenty four reported that the combination laws had not only not been efficient to prevent combinations either of masters or workmen but on the contrary it had a tendency to produce mutual irritation and distrust to give a violent character to the combinations and to render them highly dangerous to the peace of the community in accordance with the recommendation of the committee a law was passed repealing all the existing acts against trade combination and leaving masters and workmen alike absolutely free to combine hume and francis place a radical tailor were responsible for this measure huskisson regarded it as too sweeping his fears were speedily realized the immediate results were disastrous several strikes occurred accompanied by considerable violence and disorder and in eighteen twenty five it was found necessary to pass a further act which declared that combinations had been found injurious to trade and commerce dangerous to the tranquillity of the country and especially prejudicial to the interests of all who were concerned in them the common law of conspiracy was consequently reaffirmed a very limited right of combination was conceded but penalties were prescribed for violence threats intimidation molestation or obstruction by any person for the purpose of forcing a master to alter his mode of business or a workman to refuse or leave work or of forcing any person to belong to or conform to the rules of any club or association the general effect of this act was to render trade unions non-legal but not necessarily criminal associations as such they were excluded from the benefits of the friendly societies act and their funds were left at the mercy of dishonest officials in this unsatisfactory position they remained for more than forty years labor troubles though serious in themselves did not seriously retard the general economic recovery the wisdom of the measures promoted by robinson and huskisson were speedily vindicated by results gloomy prognostications were unfulfilled and on the meeting of parliament in eighteen twenty five ministers were greeted with a chorus of congratulations our present prosperity said the mover of the address in the house of lords was a prosperity extending to all orders all professions and all districts the debate in the lower house was an echo of that in the upper and both were endorsed by the judgment of a highly competent contemporary observer nearly all property has risen greatly in pecuniary value and every branch of internal industry was thriving agricultural distress had disappeared the persons employed at the cotton and woolen manufactures were in full employment the various departments of the iron trade were flourishing on all sides new buildings were in progress of erection and money was so abundant that men of enterprise though without capital found no difficulty in commanding funds for any plausible undertaking a detailed statistical investigation substantiates these glowing generalizations but only a few examples can here be quoted the official value of the exports which in eighteen twenty was forty eight million nine hundred and fifty one thousand five hundred and thirty seven pounds rose by eighteen thirty to sixty nine million six hundred and ninety one thousand three hundred and three pounds imports in the former year were thirty two million four hundred and thirty eight thousand six hundred and fifty pounds in the latter forty six million two hundred and forty five thousand two hundred and forty one pounds the imports of foreign wool which amounted in eighteen twenty to less than ten million pounds in eighteen thirty exceeded thirty two million pounds the number of spinners employed in the manufacture of cotton rose in ten years from sixty eight thousand two hundred and fifty seven in eighteen twenty one 
to one hundred and thirty five thousand seven hundred and forty two similar illustrations of expanding prosperity might be almost indefinitely multiplied end of section seven section eight of england since waterloo by john arthur ransom marriott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter four the last years of tory rule eighteen twenty two to eighteen thirty social and fiscal reforms catholic emancipation part two the pace was at first too rapid when trade is booming manufacturers have no time to think they act and apparently to the end of time will act as though the sun of prosperity would shine for ever as though cyclical disturbances were unknown phenomena to the improvidence of honest trade was added the folly and knavery of wild financial speculation to the excitement thus engendered there had been no parallel since the bursting of the south sea bubble no scheme was too fantastic to secure the support of the unwary over one hundred and seventy four million pounds of capital was subscribed for new companies during the year eighteen twenty four and the beginning of eighteen twenty five four hundred thirty five petitions for private bills were presented to the session of eighteen twenty five and no fewer than two hundred and eighty six became law money was exceptionally cheap and banks and discounters were ridiculously complacent the inevitable results ensued as the year eighteen twenty five went on the all too familiar symptoms of the coming storm began to manifest themselves demand slackened stocks accumulated prices came down with a run banks took alarm confidence was shaken credit contracted and by the end of the year england was in the throes of a terrible financial crisis on december fifth the great banking house of sir peter pole and company suspended payment as they kept the accounts of forty-four country banks the shock thus given to credit was tremendous in the next few weeks seventy-eight banks including five great london houses closed their doors the mint and the bank of england did all they could to mitigate the severity of the crisis sovereigns were coined and issued at the rate of one hundred and fifty thousand a day but the bank itself was saved mainly by the accidental discovery of seven hundred thousand one-pound notes after this the violence of the storm abated but the government felt compelled to propose legislation to prevent if possible its recurrence the circulation of notes under five pounds was prohibited in england after february fifth eighteen twenty nine footnote scotland successfully resisted the prohibition of small notes a result due largely to the letters of malachi malagrother in which sir walter scott showed himself no unworthy successor to swift End footnote. and an important measure was passed to give greater security to country banks hitherto under the charter of the bank of england no private bank might have more than six partners all restrictions of this nature were now removed in the case of all banks except those within sixty-five miles of london despite urgent pressure the government refused in the true spirit of benthamite laissez-faire to issue exchequer bills but they persuaded the bank to advance three million pounds to merchants upon the security of their merchandise these means did much to restore confidence to capitalists but little to alleviate the sufferings of the wage earners these sufferings during the winter of eighteen twenty five and eighteen twenty six were acute on the whole they were borne on the testimony of the king's speech with exemplary patience 
but nevertheless riots were reported from many manufacturing centres from norwich bradford trowbridge dudley carlisle and all parts of lancashire in a single week over one thousand power looms were smashed in blackburn in the neighbourhood and throughout lancashire the destruction of fixed capital was great prolonged drought in the year of eighteen twenty six added to the general discomfort and in fear of deficient harvests the government hurriedly adopted two remedial measures by the first wheat stored in bonded warehouses was allowed to come into market on payment of a duty of ten shillings per quarter by the second the government was authorized temporarily to open the ports to a limited amount five hundred thousand quarters of foreign oats and other grain having passed these bills parliament was dissolved on june second the general election created little excitement but the two questions most in agitation were the corn laws and the catholic claims a brief autumn session was opened on november fourteenth in order to give ministers an indemnity for further though temporary infringement of the corn laws before parliament reassembled the duke of york most kind and best-natured of princes passed away january fifth eighteen twenty seven the king was anxious to succeed his brother as commander-in-chief but lord liverpool insisted that the duke of wellington should have the post it was his last exercise of authority as prime minister before the session was a week old he was struck down by apoplexy february seventeenth and though death was not immediate he never recovered sufficiently to take any further part in politics it was said of him with truth by the american minister that if he was not the ablest man in his cabinet he was essentially its head his mortal illness not only dissolved the cabinet but broke up the party which for years past had been kept together only by his authority and tact upon whom would his mantle fall i think somehow wrote creevy it must be canning after all and that then he'll die of it in both respects creevy's forecast was accurate but canning's succession was by no means a foregone conclusion it was settled only after weeks of negotiation and intrigue and it smashed into fragments the party to which he belonged that canning was incomparably the ablest man in the cabinet and in the party goes without saying but he had no strong political connection his catholic sympathies were not popular in the country his liberal views were repugnant to the upper house and his brilliant wit did not conciliate the lower he rarely it was said delivers an important speech without making an enemy for life because he talked so well men thought him a knave as they thought castlereagh a fool because he talked so badly eight dukes signed a remonstrance to the king against his appointment as prime minister and when it is remembered that tory peers returned over one hundred members to the house of commons the strength of the forces opposed to canning will be appreciated the day-to-day -day details of the struggle which ensued may be followed by the curious in the correspondence and diaries of j w crocker who was behind the scenes they are more interesting than edifying conscious of his own claims canning informed the king in plain terms that the substantive power of a prime minister he must have and what's more must be known to have but conscious also of his isolation in his own party he advised the king to form an anti-catholic ministry without him the king with a just appreciation of canning's value at the foreign office suggested that canning and peel should serve under the duke of wellington canning declined and on april tenth received his majesty's commands to form a government and kissed hands as first lord of the treasury and chancellor of the exchequer 
of the members of the late cabinet peel eldon the duke lord bathurst lord melville and lord westmoreland refused to serve in the new canning was consequently compelled to look to the whigs for general support though lord lansdowne and tierney were the only prominent members of that party who entered the cabinet robinson raised to the peerage as lord goderich became colonial secretary with the leadership of the house of lords lord dudley went to the foreign office sturges bourne kept the home office warm for lord lansdowne until july lord harrowby retained the presidency of the council and huskisson that of the board of trade of the new appointments the most interesting were those of copley who as lord lyndhurst accomplished the amazing feat of ousting lord eldon from the woolsack and palmerston who retaining the secretaryship of war for the first time entered the cabinet he seldom quitted it during the next thirty-five years canning survived the attainment of his honourable ambition only long enough to taste the bitterness of power a chill caught at the duke of york's funeral fastened upon a constitution already undermined his opponents gave him no peace peel stood aside in dignified aloofness but the tory underlings literally hunted him to death in the house of commons and in the lords he was attacked with cruel acerbity by the leading peers he managed with huskisson's help to carry through the commons an ingenious measure providing for a sliding scale on imported corn but it was so emasculated by the lords at the instance of wellington that it was withdrawn the broken session ended on july second on august fourth canning was seized with mortal illness and on the eighth he died at chiswick canning's reputation rests primarily upon his foreign policy proclaimed to the world in language not devoid of bombast it was none the less conceived on sound lines and executed with unusual vigour in a sense larger than he knew he called a new world into existence to redress the balance of the old his contemporaries in europe clung to the outworn formulas and absolutist principles which had dominated diplomacy in the eighteenth century and had inspired the settlement of eighteen fifteen it is to the eternal credit of canning to have perceived that the edifice built upon these foundations could not stand more than this he understood as few did that the ideas and forces which had emerged from the revolutionary chaos ideas which continental statesmen were anxious only to repress were fundamentally conservative in essence among these the most potent was that of nationality and upon this canning's policy was founded hence his memory as a diplomatist links itself with those of the great constructive statesmen the cavours the bismarcks whose work is characteristic of the nineteenth century as a domestic reformer he must be classed with the enlightened statesmen of the pre-revolutionary epoch the pitts darandas and turgot to reform in the narrower electoral sense he was opposed of administrative reform he was a keen advocate the causes of religious equality of slave emancipation of free trade of free labour lost in canning one of their best and most effective friends goderich carried on canning's administration during the recess there was some shuffling of places and some new men were introduced but as the ministry was practically stillborn the details are unimportant goderich after a fruitless effort to allay ministerial squabbles and jealousies resigned on january eighth eighteen twenty eight the duke of wellington succeeded to the premiership and for a few months presided over a cabinet which differed little in composition from that of his predecessors the most important changes were the return of peel to the home office with the lead of the commons 
and the appointment of Goulburn to the Exchequer. But the Canningites were not comfortable, and in the summer a considerable reconstruction was effected. To the undisguised relief of the Duke, Huskisson tendered his resignation as colonial secretary. Huskisson, indeed, was willing to be over-persuaded, but the Duke promptly closed negotiation. It is no mistake. It can be no mistake. It shall be no mistake. Dudley, Palmerston, Grant, and Lamb followed Huskisson's example. The weakness of the new government in foreign policy has been already exposed. Their domestic policy now claims consideration, but it cannot be understood without a clear appreciation of the position of their chief. The great duke did not regard politics with the eye of the ordinary politician. Principles might be eternal, but positions were to be maintained only so long as they were tenable. Office meant to him not the achievement of ambition nor even a grasp upon opportunity, but the fulfillment of grim duty. Without this knowledge, his conduct in high office might appear eccentric, not to say unprincipled. In reality, no politician was ever more simply and transparently conscientious. It was his duty to serve his king, whether in the camp or in the Senate, and no fear of criticism, no dread of inconsistency could deter him from doing it. The two years of Wellington's administration were memorable for three large measures of reform. The Test and Corporation Acts enacted during the Anglican fervor of the Restoration required every holder of office, civil or military, to receive the sacrament according to the rites of the established Church. Ever since 1727, following an example set by the sagacity of Walpole, an indemnity bill had been enacted annually by Parliament, and thus dissenters had been relieved of all penalties for violation of these laws. For a hundred years, therefore, the acts had been inoperative, but they still galled the pride, though they did not hinder the ambition of the Protestant dissenters. In 1828, Lord John Russell carried against the government a motion in favor of their repeal, Wellington and Peel bowed to the sense of the House, and despite bitter opposition from Sir Robert Ingalls and Lord Eldon, the sacramental test was abolished. There was, however, substituted a declaration apparently void of offence that office holders would do nothing to injure or subvert the Protestant established church. The same session witnessed the enactment of a corn law identical in principle with that which in the previous year Wellington's amendment had destroyed. A sliding scale was established under which a duty of 25 shillings 8 pence was imposed when the price was at or below 64 shillings and the duty diminished to 1 shilling when the price rose to 73 shillings. The sliding scale proved, however, only modestly successful it put too large a premium upon speculation. But the government were now confronted by a problem even more difficult than that of the Corn Laws. On the resignation of the Canningites, Mr. Vesey Fitzgerald was appointed to succeed Mr. Charles Grant at the Board of Trade. Fitzgerald was personally and politically one of the most popular men in Ireland, but he was, of course, a Protestant. Daniel O'Connell, though a Catholic, resolved to oppose his re-election for County Clare, and that resolution marked a turning point in the history of Ireland. But its significance must not be exaggerated. It is sometimes assumed, if not asserted, that now for the first time the assault was delivered against the virgin fortress of Protestant ascendancy. As a matter of fact, the outworks had been carried a generation ago. Only the citadel remained untaken. By successive acts of the Irish legislature passed between 1774 and 1792, most of the provisions of the penal code had been repealed, 
and most of the Catholic disabilities had been removed. By the Act of 1793, the Catholics were even admitted to the parliamentary franchise. Certain disqualifications remained. No Catholic could sit in Parliament, nor become a sheriff, nor rise to the highest posts in the army or at the bar. But these pressed not so much upon the Catholic masses as upon the classes loyal for the most part to the English connection. Pitt intended that a final and complete measure of emancipation should be a concomitant of the act of union. But for that avowed intention, the opposition to the union would have been less easily overcome. Pitt, however, counted without his sovereign. The king refused all concessions to the Catholics, Pitt resigned, and the healing measure was deferred until it was too late to heal. The Catholic question was not, however, permitted to slumber, either in the imperial parliament or in Ireland. Motions were perpetually made in the House of Lords by Lord Grenville, Lord Donamore, and Lord Wellesley in the Commons by Grattan, Plunkett, and Canning. Canning carried the House with him in 1812, and thenceforward, thanks mainly to the influence of Castlereagh, the question was officially regarded as an open one in the Liverpool Cabinet. It was in Ireland, however, not at Westminster, that the decisive battle was fought and won, and the victory was due primarily to the genius of a single individual, Daniel O'Connell. O'Connell was, of all Irish leaders, incomparably the greatest. He was magnificently endowed by nature for the part he had to play. A Herculean frame, a keen intellect, a lambent humor, consummate eloquence, a voice at once sonorous and capable of the finest shades of expression, an enthusiastic temper, tenacity and adroitness combined above all a perfect appreciation of irish character born in seventeen seventy five o'connell became in eighteen ten secretary to the catholic committee and in eighteen twenty three founded and organized the catholic association suppressed by the government in eighteen twenty five as an unlawful combination and confederacy the association was ingeniously reconstituted by O'Connell and made its power felt in the Waterford election of 1826 when it broke down the political ascendancy of the Beresfords. Still more clearly was its power demonstrated in 1828. O'Connell's triumphant return for County Clare created throughout Ireland intense excitement and compelled the Wellington government to face a situation which, by general admission, was fundamentally changed by that event. To refuse to Catholics the abstract rights of citizenship was one thing, to decline to allow a duly elected Catholic to take his seat in the House of Commons was another. Peel realized the dilemma in which the government was placed. Lord Anglesey, their Lord Lieutenant, warned them that the hope of maintaining tranquillity in Ireland depended upon the forbearance and the not very determined courage of O'Connell, and urged them, much as he abhorred the idea, of truckling to the overbearing Catholic demagogues to utilize the momentary calm to adjust the question. By the end of the session of 1828, Peel had convinced himself that the Catholic question must be settled once for all, but he decided, and with obvious propriety, that for him to remain a member of the government which must settle it was impossible. Moved, however, partly by his sense of the gravity of the crisis, partly by his loyalty to the Duke, above all by his conviction that he alone could carry an emancipation bill through Parliament, he consented, perhaps to the detriment of his own reputation, to withdraw his resignation. Parliament met on February 5th, 1829, and learned, to their amazement, that the King recommended them not only to take into deliberate consideration the whole condition of Ireland, but also 
to review the laws which impose disabilities on his majesty's roman catholic subjects to this speech the king had given a reluctant assent and stipulated that the relief bill should not be introduced until the catholic association had been suppressed a bill to effect this object was passed rapidly through both houses but before the royal assent was given the association voluntarily dissolved itself the time had now come for the fulfilment of the pledge given in the speech from the throne on march third the king made a final effort to avert surrender the ministers consequently resigned and the king eventually and reluctantly gave way on march fifth peel rose as a minister of the king and sustained by the just authority which belongs to that character to vindicate the advice given to his majesty by a united cabinet the bill passed its second reading in the commons by a majority of one hundred and eighty and in the lords by one hundred and five in the lower house peel made a gallant attempt to defend the bill upon its merits to the peers wellington bluntly commended it as a preferable alternative to civil war i am one of those he said who have probably passed a longer period of my life engaged in war than most men and principally i may say in civil war and i must say this that if i could avoid by any sacrifice whatever even one month of civil war in the country to which i am attached i would sacrifice my life in order to do it such language from the great soldier could not fail of its appeal protests were signed by the duke of cumberland sidmouth eldon and thirty-six other peers but before the middle of april the bill became law it contained various supposed securities against the spread of roman catholicism but as regards civil rights it was a large and generous measure roman catholics became eligible for almost all offices civil military parliamentary and municipal save those of regent lord lieutenant lord chancellor of england or ireland and one or two others but this politic and generous concession was immediately followed by a measure of wholesale and as it seemed penal disfranchisement emancipation had been won by the votes of the forty shilling freeholders their triumph was short-lived for by a second act of eighteen twenty nine the qualification in irish counties was raised to ten pounds and the electorate was thus reduced from two hundred thousand voters to twenty six thousand it is true that for thirty years the forties had been regarded as practically nothing more than a part of the livestock upon the estate of the landlord who created them for his own purposes but in eighteen twenty six and still more conspicuously in eighteen twenty eight the cattle had strayed from the fold the weapon said peel which the landlord has forged with so much care and has heretofore wielded with so much success has broken short in his hand the disfranchising act was the result of this miscarriage broom regarded it as the high price the all but extravagant price of emancipation but he was willing to pay it in ireland it was regarded and small wonder as a surreptitious attempt to cancel the effects of emancipation and to redress the balance in the interests of the ascendancy party less intrinsically important but not less irritating were the slights inflicted upon o'connell himself despite his eminence at the irish bar he was markedly passed over in the distribution of silk and even more unfortunately he was compelled before taking his seat to seek re-election for county clare he was not opposed and the re-election rendered necessary by technicalities was hardly more than formal but it gave the agitator an opportunity which he did not neglect in my person he declared the county of clare has been insulted to you is due the honour of having converted peel and conquered wellington such language may sound mere bombast to englishmen in ireland 
it had its effect. Thanks in part to the adroitness of the agitator, in part to the tactlessness of the English ministries, emancipation did little to allay discontent in Ireland. Conceded in a reluctant spirit, footnote, Peel's personal position is disclosed frankly and fully in his memoirs, volume one, emancipation involved a painful sacrifice to him and some discredit to the university of oxford peel felt bound to resign his seat and failed to secure re-election against sir robert ingalls he immediately secured a seat at westbury End footnote. and carried with irritating concomitance a healing measure may well fail to heal granted to ireland in eighteen o one emancipation might have served to consolidate the union wrested from england in eighteen twenty nine it was destined to inaugurate the agitation for repeal neither the king nor his ministry long survived the act of catholic emancipation apart from questions of foreign policy already discussed there was nothing in the remaining years of the king's reign to demand the attention of the historian on June 26, 1830, George the Fourth died after a prolonged illness, and his brother, the Duke of Clarence, succeeded to the throne as William the Fourth. The change of sovereigns was opportune. A bad man and a bad king, George the Fourth died unregarded and unrespected by his subjects. His successor, Bluff genial and kind-heartedly eccentric was commended to them alike by his profession and by his personality and times were such that the cause of monarchy needed all the adventitious aid he could command before the new reign was many weeks old the july revolution had broken out in france the old bourbon monarchy had been finally overthrown a severe blow had been struck at the principle of legitimacy and therefore at the european settlement founded upon it louis philippe had been installed as a citizen king charles the tenth was in exile and half europe was in a state of turmoil and insurrection the events passing in france exercised an immense influence upon england and upon europe but the history of that reaction belongs to a new reign and a new ministry for the long spell of Tory administration was at an end, and Lord Palmerston, not Lord Aberdeen, was responsible for the protection of British interests during the critical years which followed upon the Revolution of 1830. The Parliament elected in 1826 was dissolved in consequence of the death of George IV on July 24, 1830. The general election took place amid signs of unusual excitement. The government lost 50 seats. Broome was returned without trouble or expense to himself for Yorkshire, and two of Peel's brothers were defeated. On November 2nd, the new parliament was opened by the king in person, and Wellington at once made it clear that no measure of parliamentary reform could be expected from the existing administration. The attack was immediately opened in both houses all along the line, and on November 16th the Ministry, having already suffered defeat on the question of the new civil list, announced its resignation. The formation of the new government was entrusted to Lord Grey. The resignation of Wellington and Peel in 1830 closes a great epoch in English history. England had been ruled by a succession of Tory ministries virtually without break, for sixty years. Their rule was coincident with the most momentous period of modern history, a period which witnessed the loss of our first colonial empire and the beginning of a second, the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, the Irish Union and Catholic Emancipation, the Industrial Revolution and the birth of a New England. The overthrow of the Wellington administration was in the nature of things. The Tory party had ceased to stand for the old principles and was exhausted in personnel. In the pre-reform era, the swing of the party pendulum was more deliberate than now, but it was nevertheless perceptible, 
at half-century intervals. Moreover, Peel and Wellington had made the fatal error of encouraging foes at the expense of friends. The old Tories were disgusted at the great betrayal of 1829. The new Whigs were stimulated to fresh hopes by the obvious weakening in the resistance to reform. The accession of a new sovereign with Whig sympathies, the overthrow of the legitimist regime in France, the manifestations of liberal tendencies in Italy and Germany and Belgium, all these contributed to the overthrow of the old regime in England. But the vital issue which in 1830 divided parties was that of parliamentary reform. Wellington bluntly refused to touch the question. In his famous speech in the House of Lords, he said emphatically that he was not only not prepared to bring forward any measure of this nature, but he would at once declare that as far as he was concerned, as long as he held any station in the government of the country, he should always feel it his duty to resist such measures when proposed by others. Footnote. For the whole of the speech, see Hansard, Third Series, Volume 152. The speech is almost an echo of Paley's words. We have a House of Commons composed of 558 members, in which number are found the most considerable landowners and merchants of the kingdom, the heads of the army, the navy, and the law, the occupiers of great offices in the state, together with many private individuals eminent by their knowledge, eloquence, and activity. If the country be not safe in such hands, in whom may it confide its interests? Does any new scheme of representation promise to collect together more wisdom or to produce firmer integrity? Moral Philosophy, Volume 2, page 220, and footnote. That speech sealed the fate of the old Tory party and definitely closed the half-century of Tory rule. End of Section 8《Section 9 of England Since Waterloo》by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Book 2. The Reign of the Middle Classes, 1832-1867. Chapter 5. The Rule of the Whigs. Parliamentary Reform and After. 1830 to 1833, Part 1. The supreme issue between parties at this moment was that of parliamentary reform. It was therefore appropriate that on the resignation of Wellington and Peel, the formation of the new ministry should be entrusted to Earl Grey. Born in 1764, the scion of an ancient Northumbrian house, and the oldest son of a distinguished soldier, he entered the House of Commons as member for his native county in 1786. In 1792 he became the most influential spokesman of the Society of Friends of the People, and thence onwards for forty years was the foremost advocate of parliamentary reform. In 1792, 1793, and 1797 he brought forward motions in the House of Commons only to encounter a solid phalanx of opposition inspired to reaction by the dread example of France. But despite his long political career, Lord Grey had little administrative experience. Less than two years at the Admiralty and the Foreign Office, 1806 and 1807, represented the sum of his official life. Nevertheless, he was obviously marked out as the chief of a reform ministry, and the king's choice merely ratified general expectation. With four exceptions, his colleagues in the cabinet were all peers, and the exceptions were not far removed from that order. Edward Geoffrey Stanley, eldest son of Lord Stanley, who was heir to the earldom of Derby, became chief secretary for Ireland. Lord Altrip was Chancellor of the Exchequer. Mr. Charles Grant, 
afterwards Lord Glenelg, was President of the Board of Control, and Sir James Graham, a great territorial magnate, was First Lord of the Admiralty. The secretaryships of state were all entrusted to Canningites. Lord Palmerston, foreign, Lord Goderich, war and colonies, and Lord Melbourne, home. Huskisson also would doubtless have been included in the new ministry, but for his death by accident at the opening of the Manchester and Liverpool Railway, September 15, 1830. His absence seriously weakened Gray's government in the Department of Finance. With the possible exception of the Foreign Secretary, the most masterful personality in the Cabinet was Henry Broom, now elevated to the Peerage and the Woolsack. Footnote. As Lord Broom and Vox, Vox et praetaria nihil, as the wits had it, Revel's comment is characteristic. The joy is great and universal, all men feel that he is emasculated and drops on the woolsack as on his political deathbed. Once in the House of Lords, there is an end of him, and he may rant, storm, and thunder without hurting anybody. End footnote. Lord Grey's own boast in regard to his cabinet is said to have been that in acreage it surpassed any previous record. Whiggism was certainly dying hard. The situation which confronted Lord Grey's ministry was not devoid of difficulty. In Ireland, O'Connell had already unfurled the flag of repeal, and the troops had been called out, October 1830, to suppress the disturbances which marked the inauguration of the new agitation. In England, there were ominous signs of a recrudescence of the recent epidemic of social disorder. Luddites and Rick Burners were again to the fore. Every post, writes Greville, brings fresh accounts of conflagrations, destruction of machinery, association of laborers, and compulsory rise of wages. Cobbett and Carlyle write and harangue to inflame the minds of the people, who are already set in motion and excited by all events which have happened abroad. Footnote. Richard Carlyle, a well-known secularist lecturer. End footnote. The new ministry had not been in office two days before they found it necessary to issue a proclamation offering large rewards for the discovery of offenders, rioters, or burners, and promising all the Lord Lieutenant's assistance in the suppression of disorder. Hampshire, Wilts, Berkshire, and Buckingham were particularly conspicuous for crime and disturbance, and in December no less than 1,000 rioters, 700 of whom came from Hans and Wilts, were brought to trial before a special commission at Winchester. In January, Carlyle was convicted at the Old Bailey of addressing inflammatory language to the laboring classes, and was sentenced to two years' imprisonment and a fine of 200 pounds. Cobbett, arraigned on a similar charge, escaped punishment owing to the postponement of his trial for six months. By that time, the panic caused by agrarian disorder had abated, and public interest was concentrated upon the fate of the Reform Bill. For some large measure of parliamentary reform, the time was clearly ripe. It is true that there had been in recent years some slackening in the intensity of the demand, for whereas the year 1821 had produced a crop of 19 petitions in favor of reform, and the year 1823 no less than 29, the years between 1824 and 1829 had produced none at all. Commercial prosperity is a pure solvent of political agitation. But in 1830, prosperity was once more waning, and interest in purely political questions was quickened by the outbreak of revolution in France. In July, the legitimist monarchy, which had been restored by the bayonets of the Allies in 1815, finally tottered to its fall. Charles X was driven into exile, and Louis-Philippe, Duke of Orléans, thanks mainly to the support of the Parisian bourgeoisie, was installed as the citizen king. The shock thus given to the principle of legitimacy was felt in greater or less degree 
in most of the European states, in Poland, Italy, Germany, and most of all in Belgium. Great Britain felt it least, but even here it gave renewed impulse to the cry for parliamentary reform. That cry could no longer be stifled or ignored. Not since the middle of the 15th century had there been any general enactment in regard to the electoral franchise and the act of Henry VI, confining the county franchise to 40 shilling freeholders, had been reactionary and restrictive. The Tudors had greatly increased the number of the House of Commons by bestowing representation on Wales and by the creation of numerous parliamentary boroughs, many of them towns of considerable importance. The Stuarts followed suit, but since the revolution of 1688, there had been no alteration either in the franchise or in the distribution of seats in England and Wales. But in the half-century before 1830, a new England had, as we have seen, come into being. Population, which had been thin and scattered, was not only increasing with great rapidity, but also shifting in distribution. Towns, which in Tudor and Stuart times had been important centers of trade, were decaying into hamlets. Villages were growing into cities. The counties north of the Trent, which down to the 18th century were mostly poor and thinly populated, were becoming the centers of industrial activity. Bradford-on-Avon was yielding pride of place in the woolen trade to Bradford-on-Air. Manchester and Liverpool, Leeds and Birmingham, were quickly attaining to the preeminence which they have never since lost. But electoral changes had not kept pace with economic development. Of the 203 parliamentary boroughs in 1831, no less than 115 were contained in the ten maritime counties between the Wash and the Severn and the county of Wilts, and of the 115, no less than 56 were on the Tideway. But this distribution, as Mr. Porritt points out, presents no paradox, when the social and industrial conditions of England up to the reign of Elizabeth are borne in mind. Any anomalies which had arisen were of comparatively recent origin, but they were sufficiently glaring. Such places as Old Sarum, Newton, Isle of Wight, Gatton, Bramber, Bossany, Burlston, Hedden, Brackley, Tregony, some of them hardly distinguishable hamlets, returned two members apiece. Manchester, Birmingham, Leeds, Sheffield, Wolverhampton, Halifax, Bolton, and Bradford returned none. The vagaries of the electoral franchise were not less bewildering than those of the distribution of seats. The county members were elected on a uniform franchise by the 40-shilling freeholders. But in the boroughs, the utmost variety prevailed. In some, known as Scott and Lot boroughs, all ratepayers were entitled to vote. In others, only the hereditary freemen. In others, only members of the municipal corporation. In others, pot wallopers. Footnote. All persons with a hearth of their own. End footnote. While in others, the franchise was attached to the ownership or occupation of particular houses known as ancient tenements. But it is noticeable that even in boroughs where the franchise was theoretically wide, it was, in practice, narrow and confined. Thus, in Gatton, where it was enjoyed by all freeholders and Scotland lot inhabitants, there were only seven qualified to exercise it, and in Tavistock, only ten. In the whole of England, Wales, Ireland, and Scotland, out of 16 million people, there were only 160,000 electors. It was alleged in 1793 by the Society of the Friends of the People that out of 513 members for England and Wales, 70 were returned by boroughs which had practically no electors at all, 90 by boroughs with less than 50, and a further 37 by towns with less than 100 voters apiece. According to another calculation, 254 members were said to represent an aggregate constituency of less than 11,500. 
bad in England, things were even worse in Ireland and Scotland. Out of the 300 members in the Irish House of Commons, 216 represented boroughs or manors, and of these, 200 were elected by 100 individuals and nearly 50 by 10. In Scotland, the 66 boroughs contained in the aggregate 1,450 electors. Edinburgh and Glasgow had 33 apiece, while the county of Bute, out of a population of 14,000, possessed 21 electors, of whom only one was resident. It was the restriction of the franchise which threw such enormous power into the hands of the government of the great territorial magnates and the Indian nabobs, and which contributed in large measure to the almost universal corruption prevailing in the borough constituencies. A vote was a possession far too valuable to be parted with except for a high consideration, and it has been estimated that prior to 1832 not more than one-third of the members of the House of Commons represented the free choice even of the limited bodies of electors then entrusted with the franchise. Sidney Smith, writing in 1821, declared that the country belongs to the Duke of Rutland, Lord Lonsdale, the Duke of Newcastle, and about twenty other holders of boroughs. They are our masters. The statement was grossly exaggerated, but it had in it more than a semblance of truth. The Duke of Newcastle did in fact return eleven members, Lord Lonsdale nine, Lord Darlington seven, and the Duke of Rutland, the Marquis of Buckingham, and Lord Carrington, six apiece. In 1780, the Duke of Richmond declared that not more than 6,000 men returned a clear majority of the House of Commons. A petition presented in 1793 on behalf of the Friends of the People by Gray declared that 357 members were returned by 154 patrons, of whom 40 were peers. According to the detailed analysis of Oldfield, no less than 487 out of 658 members of the House of Commons were, in 1816, nominees. Of the English members, 218 were returned by the nomination or influence of 87 peers, 137 by 90 powerful commoners, and 16 by the government itself. Of the 45 Scotch members, 31 were returned by 21 peers, the remainder by 14 commoners. In Ireland, 51 were returned by 36 peers and 20 by 19 commoners. Allowing a considerable margin for exaggeration in these various estimates, it is impossible in face of them to maintain that the pre-reform system was representative in anything but the crudest sense. Gross corruption alike in the constituencies and among the elected or nominated representatives was the inevitable corollary of such a system. To the sale and purchase of seats, the term cannot in fairness be applied. A seat was as much a marketable commodity in the 18th century as an advowson in the 19th, and the legitimacy of the transaction was recognized alike in Pitt's Reform Bill of 1785 and the Act of Union of 1800. In each case, the value of a seat was estimated at over £7,000. Nor was this excessive, for sums far in excess of this amount were frequently spent on a parliamentary contest. Thus, in 1768, the Bentinks and the Lowthers spent £40,000 apiece in contesting the counties of Cumberland and Westmoreland, while at York, in 1807, the expenses of Lord Milton and Mr. Lascelles are said to have amounted in the aggregate to the astounding sum of £200,000. Repeated attempts were made to restrain these abuses, but with very imperfect success, and long before 1830 it had become obvious that nothing would really avail to cleanse the Aegean stable short of a drastic redistribution of seats and a wide extension of the franchise. In 1780, the Society for Constitutional Information, anticipating by 60 years the famous 
points of the charter demanded universal suffrage and equal electoral districts pitt in 1785 gave ministerial sanction to a scheme of extinguishing some of the rottenest of the boroughs by compensating their owners and distributing their representatives among the counties and some of the largest towns to admit the principle that a borough was property saleable and purchasable was perhaps inexpedient though it subsequently served to oil the wheels of the irish union and the rejection of pitt's bill meant the postponement of reform for nearly half a century no one could think seriously of reform while france was involved in revolution still less while the energies of the nation were concentrated upon defeating napoleon but the flood pent up for twenty-five years burst all barriers after eighteen fifteen with results already described throughout the autumn and winter of eighteen thirty and eighteen thirty one there was a continuous agitation in favour of reform the seed sown in many soils during the last half century was rapidly ripening for harvest the philosophical radicalism of the utilitarians the work of bentham of james and john stuart mill of hume and others the democratic liberalism of francis place the communism of robert owen all these were bearing fruit in the ferment of opinion and the political organization which immediately preceded the reform bill of eighteen thirty one the first work of the gray ministry was to appoint a committee to draft a bill to amend the representation of the people in england and wales the committee consisted of two members of the cabinet lord durham and sir james graham lord duncannon the chief government whip and lord john russell to these as they were approaching the end of their labours the duke of richmond was added creevy declares that of the bill which is known to history as his lord grey knew not one syllable till it was presented to him already cut and dry this myth has been finally exposed by the publication of graham's memorandum on the proceedings in the committee of four the original draft proposed by the committee was substantially amended by the cabinet who number one struck out the vote by ballot retained septennial as against quinquennial parliaments and number three substituted ten pounds for the proposed twenty pound rating qualifications in boroughs on march first lord john russell though not yet a member of the cabinet laid the ministerial proposals before the house of commons they proved to be more drastic than even the most sanguine radicals had dared to hope the first feature of the bill was a large measure of disfranchisement sixty boroughs with less than two thousand inhabitants apiece returning in the aggregate one hundred and nineteen members were to be totally disfranchised the united boroughs of weymouth and malcolm regis were to lose two of their four members forty-seven other boroughs with more than two thousand but less than four thousand inhabitants were to lose one member apiece thus one hundred and sixty-eight seats were placed at the disposal of the government enfranchisement was on an adequate but less generous scale seven of the largest unrepresented towns like manchester and birmingham were to get two members apiece twenty more were to get one the london boroughs were to get eight fifty-seven were to go to the english counties three to ireland five to scotland and one to wales the net reduction in the numbers of the house was to be sixty-two as to voting qualification there was an immense simplification in the boroughs there was to be a ten pound rating qualification and freemen were to retain their votes in the counties copyholders and fifty pound tenants were added to the old forty shilling freeholders the bill passed the second reading by a majority of only one before it was committed general gascoigne carried by a majority of eight an instruction that there should be no diminution in the total number of representatives of england and wales on this rebuff the ministry declared upon an immediate appeal to the country on april twenty second parliament was dissolved in hot haste by the king and amid the wildest excitement a general election was held 
the issue was as nearly isolated as it ever can be in english politics the bill the whole bill and nothing but the bill was the rallying cry of the whigs their triumph was complete and they came back with a majority of more than a hundred the reform bill with only a few minor changes was reintroduced by lord john russell on june twenty fourth and on july seventh it was read a second time by a majority of one hundred and thirty six three hundred and sixty seven to two hundred and thirty one the tories fought it for two months in committee but before the end of september it was sent up to the lords backed by a majority substantially undiminished the lords after nearly a week's debate threw it out october eighth by a majority of forty one one hundred and ninety nine to one hundred and fifty eight the action of the lords is said to have brought the country to the verge of revolution there were serious riots in several of the large towns notably in derby nottingham worcester coventry and most serious of all in bristol it is difficult to believe that these were the work of the classes about to be enfranchised the reform bill however was looked upon only as an instalment the political principle once admitted was to be the lever for far-reaching social and economic change behind the utilitarians were the owenites social revolution was to come in the wake of political reform the whigs might persuade themselves that a measure so generous and comprehensive would be accepted by all parties as a final settlement the tories knew better so did the radicals the chartists best of all not otherwise can we explain the disturbances in the autumn of eighteen thirty one commercial and agricultural distress and the dread of pestilence footnote cholera appeared in november End footnote. doubtless added fuel to the flames but the conflagration was due to a mass of economic and social discontent which had been accumulating during the last half century that discontent found as we shall see cold comfort in the clauses of the act of eighteen thirty two but the immediate cry was for the bill parliament was reopened on december sixth a week later lord john russell introduced his third reform bill this time in a shape considerably altered the disfranchisement clauses were decidedly less rigorous and were based not only on the principle of population but upon the number of inhabited houses and the contribution of the town to the assessed taxes more important still the numbers of the house were to remain unchanged the bill passed rapidly through all its stages in the house of commons and before the end of march was launched upon its perilous voyage to the lords would the ship reach port safely in no responsible quarter was it believed that the lords would yield without coercion or the certain prospect of its application if they gave the bill a second reading it would only be with the intention of emasculating it in committee under these circumstances some of the cabinet were in favour of obtaining from the king an immediate guarantee that he would assent if necessary to the creation of a sufficient number of peers to carry the bill the king however demurred lord grey himself was reluctant and the majority of the cabinet decided to await events in the lords thanks to the attitude of the waverers the bill was read a second time april fourteenth by a majority of nine one hundred and eighty four to one hundred and seventy five but on may seventh lord lyndhurst carried by a large majority one fifty one to one sixteen a motion in favour of postponing the clauses with schedule a dealing with the disfranchisement of the smallest boroughs until the rest of the bill had been approved the situation foreseen by lord durham sir james graham and other stalwarts in the cabinet had actually arisen and the cabinet now advised the king to create as many peers as might ensure the success of the bill in all its essential principles the king though in favour of extensive reform was strongly opposed on principle to the coercion of the peers and regretfully accepted the proffered resignation of the ministry 
the house of commons expressed its confidence in the retiring ministry by a large majority and the country was profoundly agitated by the crisis the king turned to lord lyndhurst to manners sutton then speaker of the house of commons and to the duke of wellington neither lyndhurst nor manners sutton could form a ministry but the duke was willing to try in order to save the sovereign from the indignity of having so gross a violation of the constitution imposed upon him but everything really depended upon peel no ministry could now avoid a large measure of reform not even to save the king and the lords was peel prepared to pledge himself to this negotiations broke down and on may fourteenth the duke advised the king to recall lord grey for his own part the duke promised that in order to save his majesty's personal honour as to the creation of peers he would remove all pretence for such a creation by withdrawing his opposition greville's appreciation of the personal conduct of the two leading actors in this episode is not very wide of the mark peel acted right from bad motives the duke wrong from good ones the grey ministry was reinstated and the king in writing granted permission to earl grey and to his chancellor lord brougham to create such a number of peers as will be sufficient to ensure the passing of the reform bill first calling up peers's eldest sons the battle was won the opponents of the bill in the house of lords withdrew and on june seventh the bill received the royal assent the same session witnessed the passing of similar bills for the reform of the representation in scotland and ireland the changes effected by this legislation in its final shape may now be summarized first as regards disfranchisement fifty-six boroughs with less than two thousand inhabitants were totally disfranchised of these fifty-five had two members each one higgum ferrers had one weymouth and malcolm regis lost two of their four members and thirty boroughs with less than four thousand inhabitants lost one of their two members thus one hundred and forty-three seats were surrendered these were redistributed as follows sixty-five to english and welsh counties forty-four to twenty-two english boroughs to each twenty-one to single-member boroughs eight to scotland five to ireland the total numbers therefore remained unchanged at six hundred and fifty-eight in the boroughs a uniform ten-pound household franchise was established with the reservation of the rights of resident freemen in corporate towns in the counties the old forty shilling freeholders were reinforced by copyholders and long leaseholders and by tenants at will paying a rent of fifty pounds a year in scotland the county franchise was given to all owners of property of ten pounds a year and to certain leaseholders in ireland to owners as in england and twenty pound occupiers the final and total result was the addition of some four hundred and fifty five thousand electors to the roll in addition which more than tripled the electorate in the towns political power was vested mainly in the merchants manufacturers and shopkeepers in the counties in the landowners and farmers in addition to the clauses defining the franchise and the distribution of seats the act of eighteen thirty two provided for the formation of a register of voters for the division of constituencies into convenient polling districts and for the restriction of the polling to two successive days end of section nine